Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Changyana Kanfora. I am the Director of Development for the MSU Museum. And uh, I want to welcome you tonight to Resisting Sexual Violence Through a Racial Justice Lens Towards Inclusive Transformation. Um, I do want to start by saying that tonight's event is being recorded and the video will be uploaded after it is closed captioned and will be available on the MSU Museum's um, website uh, for accessibility. Tonight's panel is part of a speaker series connected to the MSU Museum's upcoming exhibit, Finding Our Voice, Sister Survivors Speak. Um, there are flyers um, for future roundtable discussions, such as tonight, um, that are associated with this exhibit. And there um, is also a flyer for the Save the Date for the exhibit opening uh, later in April, available back there. Inspired by the hundreds of teal bows and ribbons that were tied around campus trees in early 2018, the exhibit will give voice to the continuing struggle to heal, to challenge injustice, to, to demand institutional accountability, and to build a better world free of sexual assault. It is being developed through a community co-curation co process with a committee of sister survivors and parents who are generously providing guidance <laughs> and wisdom to the creation of the exhibit. This exhibit will open on April 16th at the MSU Museum in East Lansing and will be open for at least a year. I want to thank our partner in our spring speaker series, um, the Army of Survivors. Um, there is a, a back with the table um, with information. Um, there's information, handouts, and educational materials also from the Army of Survivors. I also want to thank Gina Baker Calloway, director of the MSU Detroit Center for hosting this event tonight. Thank you so much. Um, tonight's panel will be moderated by Dr. Mark Auslander, who is standing in for MSU law professor Melanie Jacobs, who unfortunately could not be here tonight due to an urgent uh, work-related matter. Just a little bit about Mark um, before I introduce our other guest. Um, Mark Auslander serves as the director of the Michigan State University Museum and is an associate professor of anthropology and history at MSU. He is the author of the award-winning book, The Accidental Slave Over, Revisiting a Myth of Race and Finding an American Family. Throughout his career, he has played a leading role in making museums inclusive and accessible to diverse families and communities, engaging visitors of all ages in hands-on encounters with science, history, culture, and art. At this time, I want to ask um, Grace French, the President, Founder, and Executive Director of the Army of Survivors to come up and say a few words. Hi everybody, just wanted to say thank you guys so much for coming tonight from the Army of Survivors. We're very grateful that this conversation can continue to happen and thank you to our panelists for being willing and able to be here as well. Um, I think that tonight will be engaging and informative for a lot of people and even past the people in this room, it's an important conversation that needs to continue to happen and continue to be talked about. I, uh, there are some conversations happening, I think, about work that is being done that is not being talked about. It's really important to understand that with that work comes the responsibility to pass that along, to continue talking about it. And because part of that work is about passing it along, continuing that conversation. So very grateful that this panel is happening and for our partners at MSC Museums. Thank you. Thanks, Grace. Thank you. It's really been a meaningful partnership with the Army and with, uh, with everyone else. So uh, it's wonderful to see you all here. We know the weather is challenging, but, uh, but we're, we're very happy you all made it. So our procedure for tonight is uh, we'll be, we've asked each of our distinguished panelists to speak for between five and seven minutes, then we'll move into a general conversation uh, around these, um, these central questions uh, related to 
uh, racialized sexual violence to, to um, understanding the struggle against uh, sexual violence, sexual violence prevention and education through a racial justice lens. So we'll show perspectives on that. We'll, we'll go into a conversation, perhaps among the panelists, and then bring all of the audience into the conversation as we uh, proceed. So we'll, be, we'll begin with our host, Gina Baker uh, Calloway, who's the director of the NSU Detroit Center. Uh, she joined uh, MSU Detroit Outreach and Engagement at Michigan State in 2011. Uh, after holding multiple leadership positions across several sectors, including uh, nonprofits, healthcare, and higher education uh, here in southeastern Michigan, she directs also the MSU Partnerships Office at Franklin Wright Settlement. Some of you will know that as, as you fill Detroit. Um, she's responsible for MSU's programming in Detroit and community university partnership development, and she serves on a number of community boards and advisory committees. Uh, she's a close colleague, and we're really delighted that you're starting us on time. Thank you, Mark. And uh, a pleasure to host this conversation. Um, I think this is important work that the museum is doing, as well as you know, recognizing uh, the survivors and um, continuing the the work and the healing um, that's necessary uh, going forward. So I I want to start by saying I'm no expert in in any experiences of sexual violence. Um, I do have a public health background, so um, I am very aware of kind of the the landscape that exists. However, I've seen firsthand how the effects uh, can impact individuals, families, communities, um, and I do um, am, am remained interested in women's health issues, reproduction, um, sexual health as well. Um, I actually even completed a master's thesis in HIV and AIDS prevention in Prince George's County, Maryland, actually at the height um, of the HIV and AIDS um, epidemic. And it precipitously uh, affected large numbers of um, black communities at that epicenter where they're close neighbor to Washington, D.C. And so I got to see firsthand you know, how communities are devastated um, by a variety of different epidemics, including um, that of HIV and AIDS. So early in my career, I actually worked as a health educator in Detroit school-based health clinics in Detroit high schools, uh, namely Northern High School, which is now considered, uh, I think it's DIA, um, and Northwestern High School. And I often find myself counseling young women, young girls, um, around issues of asserting their own sexual power, their own sexual health, and um, them telling me about their encounters with their intimate partners and protecting themselves from trans, sexually transmitted diseases wasn't something that was kind of top of mind. It was really an emphasis on wanting to pre prevent being pregnant. Um, and a lot of times, um, they didn't have a lot of agency in that, um, dealing with their partners, because a lot of times their partners were men, older men. Uh, these were high school students, 13, 14, 15 years old, but they were dealing with men, grown men, 24, 25, 30, or older. Um, and, and that would come into uh, the health, they would come into the health clinics and, and want to have discussions about, well, you know, how do I, uh, I want to take a pregnancy test. You know, that was the big thing, it's taking a pregnancy test. I don't want to tell my parents anything. And so at that time, actually, um, the health clinics did not have to report to parents what these young girls were, were coming in and, and telling the counselors and, and telling the, the nurse practitioners in these, in these clinics. So, of course, a lot of times these young women were using sex kind of to escape their situations. Um, whether it be, you know, their feeling of isolation, uh, poverty, uh, neglectful homes, uh, whatever their situation might have been. And so, um, very often, um, I found myself dealing with young women who were in very precarious situations. So, uh, many of them did not openly admit that they were being coerced by their intimate partners, but 
it was pretty clear that um, at 13, 14, 15, their discernment was probably not the best uh, at that age. And so um, a lot of times they were using sex as the only way to escape their situation or to support themselves or other family members financially. Uh, so, and personally too, I've had experience where I've had too many friends and family members come to tell me about their own stories um, and encounters with sexual violence at the hands of their relatives, uh, close friends, dating relationships. So uh, these were not instances a lot of times of random sexual violence. These were people that they were supposed to ch trust and love um, in their own homes a lot of times. And so um, a lot of these occurrences occurred over long periods of time. These were years and years of abuse. Um, so that makes the trauma even that much more devastating, I think. Um, so in recent conversations around Me Too, the Me Too movement, and the devastating occurrences of abuse at MSU, um, Dr. Ford's testimony at the Kavanaugh hearings, which is all too reminiscent of the Anita Hill testimony uh, during Clarence Thomas's confirmation hearings, um, and then the re-emerging scrutiny of our entertainers, R. Kelly, with um, the docu-series Surviving R. Kelly and keeping those topics of sexual violence front and center as, as we address long-standing issues of silence, of sexual abuse, of violence in our culture and in our own families. So we're just now getting to the point where we're starting to address some of these issues more broadly and in public conversations like these in a constructive way. So unfortunately in Detroit, as in other major cities across the country, we've had our own issues of failing to address sexual assault. Um, and I'm sure we'll hear more about that as we talk about the exact laws of the thousands of rape kits that went un untested, uh, unprocessed. And those victims were mostly black females. And so we, we have to address the issue of race as, as it relates to why these were long ignored uh, rape kits. They didn't go processed. Uh, police didn't give attention to those investigations and whatnot. So as we've evidenced by the efforts of Enough Said and the AA490 efforts to crowdfund the processing of those Detroit rape kits, it's clear that the effects of ignoring um, those women, women's trauma as a result of sexual assault in our community is a long, la have long lasting repercussions. And so additionally, what persists in our current political climate are the dual issues of, of racial and class bias, as well as the compounded um, pervasive attitudes that black women's accounts of sexual assault are to be disbelieved. So as, as we are um, dealing with our current readiness to conduct national conversations around sexual assault and violence, um, we're only a, that's only a step in the larger movement um, where we have to have an ongoing process to make some meaningful reforms in mental health, in policy and legal areas, in how we deal with policing and investigations related to sexual assault and sexual trauma, dealing with the criminal justice system and how it processes through um, victims and, and abusers, as well as other societal institutions that have maintained a status quo. And so with that, I guess I'll end my comments. Thank you, Jenna. Our next speaker is uh, Daniel McGuire. She's the uh, uh, award-winning author of an absolutely extraordinary book, uh, known to many of you here, At the Dark End of the Street, Black Women, Rape, and uh, Resistance, A New History of the Civil Rights Movement from Rosa Parks to the Rise of Black Power from Knopf in 2010, and also Freedom Rights, uh, New Perspectives of the Civil Rights Movement. Um, uh, University of Kentucky Press 2011. She's an associate professor in the history department uh, just around the corner in Wayne State, uh, and she's a distinguished lecturer of the Organization of American Historians. She's currently writing a book about the 1967 Algiers uh, Motel murders, and she lives here with her family uh, right here in Metro Detroit. Another happy topic. 
Um, thank you so much for having me and um, for this incredible panel. Um, uh, how many of you remember Oprah Winfrey's speech at the Golden Globes last year? Anyone? She was she won the um, uh, the Cecil DeMille Award, right? And she stood up and she talked about how when she was a young girl, uh, she watched Sidney Poitier accept the award, and uh, she remembered her mother coming home from uh, a day of doing domestic work, and she sort of you know was lost in this Hollywood moment, and she talked uh, about that, and then she started to talk about the Me Too movement and Time's Up, and she said, "There's someone I think you should know," and. She said, Reese Taylor. Now, I just about uh, lost my mind because I had been, been doing research on Reese Taylor for close to a decade and knew her quite well. Um, and so I listened. And, and she told Taylor's story. In 1944, Reese Taylor, who was an African-American mother and sharecropper, was walking home from church when a carload of white men kidnapped her off the street and gang raped her at gunpoint. She found her way home after this horrific assault. She told her husband and her father what had happened, and somehow word got to the Montgomery NAACP office about this horrific crime in Abbeville, Alabama. The NAACP office promised Reese Taylor they'd send their very best investigator, and her name was Rosa Parks. It was 11 years before the Montgomery bus boycott. But at the time, Rosa Parks was um, investigating all kinds of incidences of racial and sexual violence um, in the state of Alabama. Oprah Winfrey told this story in a way, I think, uh, talking about her mother, doing domestic work, weaving in the narrative of Reese Taylor, talking about the actresses who had been involved in Time's Up, and, um, and, and I think she told it in a way to recenter black women and girls in the narrative. Because the truth is that black women and girls consistently have remained, over time, some of the most vulnerable um, people to uh, crimes of sexual violence. And Oprah, by telling Reese's story, I think, was also signaling um, black women's long history of resistance and testimony. Reese Taylor spoke up in 1944, decades before white feminists took back the night or health speak outs, made the personal political, and before anybody said me too. Taylor's story, therefore, is part of a much longer history, um, both terrifying and I think in some ways inspiring, of black women who endured public humiliation and risked their lives to lead the charge against unchecked sexual violence, um, which is often buried in American history. But those stories are there if you really look and if you listen to black women. Um, a really quick history lesson. This kind of resistance to sexual violence goes all the way back to slavery, which of course was not just um, uh, a, a white supremacist institution, it was a white supremacist, patriarchal, capitalist, oppressive institution uh, under which enslaved women were used for their productive labor, but also their reproductive labor, right? They were literally bred and raped in order to reproduce more slaves, which of course enriched their masters, okay? Harriet Jacobs was an enslaved um, girl in the 1830s in North Carolina. She hid out in a crawl space. Uh, we might know the story of Anne Frank, this is not that dissimilar in a totally different time period and circumstances, but she hid there to escape her master's uh, lechery. You know, he had been uh, assaulting her, attacking her. And then when she escaped, she wrote an autobiography decrying the ways in which black women and girls were used for their productive and reproductive labor, how they were literally used to make more slaves. Her autobiography helped generate uh, massive support in the North for abolition. So when we think about um, the movement to end slavery, we have to consider that it was also a movement to end sexual violence under slavery. The fight continued in the 1850s when an enslaved 19-year-old girl named Celia 
killed the man who owned her, who had subjected her to years of sexual assault, forcing, forcing her to um, bear two of his children. Um, now, it's important to remember, of course, that colonial laws made this totally legal, right? Enslaved women and girls could have um, the children of their masters, but were unprotected, right? They could not marry them. They could not benefit from inheritance laws or anything like that, but they could, of course, make new slaves. Uh, well, Celia killed this man, and she was put on trial for murder. And she told, her lawyer told the jury that she acted in self-defense, that she had the right to defend herself from that kind of violence the same way white women did. But, the judge and jury said, those rights do not apply to black women who are enslaved because they're property and therefore unravable. So when we, you know, zoom into the future to the now and we have this, you know, ongoing idea or message that black women and girls can't be raped um, because they're so often over-sexualized in our culture, it's rooted in the system of slavery, those stereotypes, those ideas. Um, Throughout the 19th century and into the 20th century, black women, especially black club women, these are middle class organizers, activists, they waged a public battle against sexual violence um, in their writing, in their public speaking. I mean, there's a whole movement uh, at the turn of the century. One of the leaders of that movement was Ida B. Wells, who we might only know as an anti-lynching activist, because so often when we talk about racial violence, the focus is on, uh, in this time period in particular, black men, um, but Ida B. Wells talked about how rape of black women was, in many ways, the, you know, the counter to the lynching of black men. And she argued that uh, while whites used rape as a justification for lynching black men, black women were really the primary victims at the time of this kind of crime. Um, Reese Taylor comes along in 1944. Her ability to testify is built on a long-standing legacy of testimony from black women. She has the ability to do that. There's lots of cases throughout the 1950s and into the 1960s of black women who spoke out publicly about sexual violence at a time when Jim Crow courtrooms denied them any kind of justice or personhood or bodily integrity. And of course, we know about Anita Hill, and uh, we should now know about Trin who started the Me Too movement. Um, I think, as in closing, you know, one of the things that really caught me about Oprah's speech is her centering. We are going to have a movement, um, a Me Too movement. We need to pay attention to those who are marginalized in our society by their race, by their sexuality, by their gender, by their class, by their uh, lack of wealth. Um, and by their age, and in order for us to end sexual violence, we need to center those who are most vulnerable to it. If they can't get justice, then none of us are really free, and none of us are really safe. Thanks. I'll just introduce Oh, sorry. Thanks. So, yeah. Thank you, Daniel. So our, our, our next uh, panelist is, is my colleague Tamara T. Butler, an assistant uh, professor in the MSU Department of English, uh, of English and also in the African American and African Studies program, which is now, as of a couple days ago, uh, thanks to the board, the, uh, the AAAS department, oh. the new department, nice. which we're very excited about. Thanks. So Dr. Butler's work focuses on 20th and 21st century black women's narratives, black girl literacies, and black women's activism connected to land and environment. Her current book project, Rooted Literacies, is a study of place-based black feminist storytelling practices emerging from the South Carolina Sea Islands. Hello. So uh, one of the things that I probably will do is I'm, I'm a big citations person, so I believe that um, the work is already done and the work is already there. So one of my stances is I like to think about citations as a way that we can start to think about um, think about sexual violence and physical violence. So one of them is Christina Sharp wrote In the Wake. And my favorite, one of the most powerful quotes from that text is, uh, quote, in the wake, the past that is not past reappears, always to rupture the present, end quote. And so I think as we've heard and will continue to hear that until we start to really deal with and come to terms with the kind of past 
that our country uh, has to, um, to the bodies of women, specifically the bodies of women of color, um, those who are economically disenfranchised, um, people who may be of uh, not citizen status as well, because those are also individuals who fall uh, victim to the hands of sexual assault. So just thinking about how, until we really deal with the, our countries um, and our globes, our global societies, um, dealing with the past, until we deal with that, it's always, the past will always disrupt and interrupt uh, the present. So another place I want to begin, these are just a lot of ruminations, a uh, word that was taught to me by Dominique C. Hill, um, who is now uh, working at Amherst College. Uh, and so I've been thinking about ruminations. So I want to begin again with the words of Demita Frazier, Beverly Smith, Barbara Smith, Celia Eisenstein, and the women of the Columbia River Collective Statement, um, of the, who authored the statement. Quote, this focusing upon our own oppression is embodied in the concept of identity politics. We believe that the most profound and potentially most radical politics come directly out of our own identity, as opposed to working to end someone else's oppression. In the case of black women, this is a particularly repugnant, dangerous, threatening, and therefore revolutionary concept. Because it is obvious from looking at all the political movements that have preceded us that anyone is more worthy of liberation than ourselves. We reject pedestals, queenhood, and walking 10 pieces behind. To be recognized as levelly human, to be recognized as human, levelly human is enough. End quote. So 1974, women come together, black feminists, black lesbians, black women who are feminists, um, just kind of coming together to have this discussion about what does it mean to work around our identities. Um, and then we want to fast forward a little bit to 2017. So today I, I got dressed and I was like, you know, I could look like a professor if that's what, I don't still know what that means. But I also was like, I, I want to wear this shirt um, because one of the conversations has been, what's the connection between sexual violence and police brutality? And so we can talk more about that, but it also made me turn to Tara Connolly in 2017 who wrote, quote, black feminist hashtags are not simply a confluence of text, hypertext, symbols, and rad radically charged feminist trends on social networking platforms. They do things. They proliferate to mediate connections across time and space, end quote. So at the time she analyzed four different texts, four different half tags that preceded the one that's on my shirt, which is say her name. And so she was looking at solidarity is for white women, black powers for black men, why I speed, and you okay sis. So those are the hashtags. And so I believe that her analysis can also be applied to how we can think about how hashtags have been mobilized and can be used um, in our activist work. So thinking specifically about say her name and then um, the hashtag believe black girls. Um, so just kind of coming to this, this present place where people are still asking us to think uh, logically about who gets left out and how our, as our identities, what's their role in our activism. And then finally, um, I ask the question of what is required of us? What are our roles um, in challenging our collective misrepresentation um, and misunderstanding of who can be survivors, who are survivors, and what does it mean? Um, and also thinking about, and so just kind of thinking about the ways that um, we represent people's stories, like who's allowed to tell whose stories, um, and for what at, for what end. And then, so I end here with where I started with quoting more folks. So continuing with my quote of Tara Connolly's work, quote, text in the context of black feminist hashtags as tools of strategy for storytelling, organizing, and resisting, and that is as sites of belonging. So thinking about how we can mobilize around these kind of digital technologies that we often see that young people are using and sometimes we dismiss them as not being activist work, but we know they're doing something. And so how can we just kind of partner alongside that um, to make this work more visible? Thank you. Thank you. We're, uh, we're very honored uh, to have tonight with us uh, Kim Lauren Worthy, who is, uh, as all of you know, uh, the Wade County Prosecutor. She received her undergraduate degree from the University of Michigan, uh, her law degree from the University of Notre Dame, Notre Dame Law School. She's been a na nationally recognized on many fronts. Uh, I, I will simply briefly mention her enormous efforts when, as has been mentioned, uh, over uh, 11,000 uh, untested sexual assault kits were found in uh, the Detroit Police Department warehouse in 2009. 
uh, the work we have, uh, since January 2015, when an offset was launched as an independent collaboration for justice between Michigan Women's Foundation, the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, and the Detroit Crime Commission has received enormous attention and is inspiring for all of us. Uh, the mission of an offset, as you will hear, is to raise funds to finish testing the remaining kits and investigate the resulting cases and prosecute rapists that uh, can work with them. Yes, yeah, so I want to just say a couple of things before I start with my remarks. And, and, and we've been thinking about this for the last few months. And in six months, just under six months, we'll be, and celebrating is the wrong word, but we'll be recognizing that we've been at this now for 10 years. And when I sit back and think about the progress that we've made and the years and years of working on this issue when nobody wanted to help and so long timelines, long timelines of events I won't go into, but it's, it's daunting that um, at the, when I first heard about this, when someone from my office first discovered these kits, I remember thinking to myself, it's probably going to take us about five years to to get through all this. And little did I know that in year 10, we still are projecting it's going to be about another three to five years. And that's added on to what we already found. So if you can diverse yourself from this place for just a second. And we all know that the big house at the University of Michigan holds 110 plus thousand people. And in this country, there's estimated to be about 400,000 untested abandoned rape kits in this country alone. And so we know that each Saturday during football season, the big house fills up, it's almost full to overflowing. And if you picture each one of those 100,000 110,000 seats being filled with a survivor or victim of whose rape kit has not been tested is enough to fill up the big house four times. That's how many we're talking about. And that's probably a conservative estimate. So you know that in August of 09, um, these kids was, were discovered. It's taken us a long way to get to where we were, but I want to talk about what, my, what our thoughts were at that time. And I think the first speaker mentioned that uh, overwhelmingly, the survivors of these kids that had, had been sexually assaulted in the most intimate of ways, who had gone to have a rape kit done, and not everybody who's sexually assaulted gets a rape kit done. And not everybody that gets a rape kit done does so for the purpose of the evidence that potentially can be found will go to get their perpetrator. A lot, a lot of women, just when I say women, but we had children and we had some men as well. And a lot of people just want to know, are they pregnant, do they have an STD? And sometimes they're not always interested in, in, in pursuing it criminally. And I get that. We all get that. And we all understand that. And so, but overwhelmingly, we find that they have wanted to go forth. So now, when we sit here in February of 2019, some of these kids are over 45 years old. 45 years old. When we started, they were between 30 and 35 years old. And by the time we're done, we're going to be approaching, you know, 48, 49, 50 years old. And that's a travesty, and people wonder why women, and again, I'm just using the word women, don't report. And they're wondering why they feel like their case, it doesn't matter. And when we have gotten our testing, and we've, we've tested almost all of them now, we're waiting for the final tests, we know that over 85% of the victims of these rape kits were women of color. Why? There's a lot of reasons why. I have felt for a very long time, and I've been, and I've been in the prosecution world for, I was an assistant prosecutor for 11 years, I was on the bench as a judge in the Wayne County Circuit Court for almost nine years, and I've been the Wayne County prosecutor now going on my 15th year. And I always knew that in the criminal justice system, the lives of victims and survivors have much less value, depending on, if, as your skin is darker. And I'll give you kind of a, an example of what I mean, and, I, and I'll just use an example. I think most of you have heard of Natalie Holloway. The, uh, the young girl who I think was on a senior trip, I think, and went down to one of the islands and then she was later disappeared and she's presumed dead, of course, for many years. Blonde hair, blue eyed, and her life had more value than at the same time that it ha that happened, there were a number of African American girls who went missing. And I don't know about a senior trip, but they went missing in the islands as well. And nobody heard their stories at all. Years ago, when I was still an assistant prosecutor, there was a nurse, and only people my age would probably remember this, named Rosemarie Cato. And I remember, I mentioned her name. It wasn't a Wayne County case, but it captivated, captivated this whole area, all of southeastern Michigan. 
And I remember it was unusual because the case got so much attention. This is prior to court TV, prior to the lawyers being on TV talking about cases. And it just had the widest amount of attention in this area. And they decided to do something very unusual. They set up a task force, home answering bank, and they let the news in record all of their tips that were coming in. And I remember watching this because I was, was interested to see, because I'd never seen anything like that in the criminal justice system. And I was watching 6 o'clock news on some channel, I don't remember which one it was, and I was watching these tips come in. And they zeroed in on this one detective, and he's obviously taking a tip from somebody. And then he says, no, 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 that's not what we're looking for. We're not looking for a black woman's body, we're looking for someone who's white and hangs up the phone. And this is on TV, I'm not saying nationwide, but it's on local TV, and clearly her life had little to no value because they were looking for this white nurse that had disappeared. One more story, and the, a set of twins, a set of older, of 85 year old white twins were killed in Detroit many years ago. And this was in the, the 80s, or early 90s. And I remember watching this case carefully too. I was special assignment at that time, doing almost exclusively homicides, so I was interested. I didn't know if I was gonna be assigned the case or not. And everybody said that someone from the neighborhood had come in and killed these older women, female twins, and it turned out it was one of them's son who came up from down south and murdered his mother and her twin sister. At the same time, front page news, at the same time, 21-year-old African-American twins were also killed. And their paper, their story didn't hit the papers at all. And it was one, one day was buried in the back. So those are just some very, very few examples, and I've seen it all, of uh, the fact that if you are a person of darker hue, the, the color of your skin is African-American, brown or black, then your life doesn't, have any, doesn't seem to have as much value. And that's why, when you study this issue across this country, many major American cities have, have found untested kids, as I said, over 400,000 estimated. Where you'll find the biggest numbers are in large urban areas where many people of color seem to be. Why? Because the rapes and sexual assaults of white women assault are worked, worked on harder and paid more attention to and very seldom go into the pile of an unsolved case. So when this first happened, we had to get a handle on everything and get everything tested and all of that, but I want to talk about three things that were done. And, and being a sexual assault survivor myself, I was particularly interested in it, but that, I wouldn't have had to have that happen to me for me to be as interested as I was. But the main thing I wanted to make sure, I wanted these survivors to have a renewed faith and trust in the criminal justice system, even though they had been abandoned for five, 10, 15, 20 years. And when we first started doing this, we found out that the biggest abusers of these women of color who had been sexually assaulted were African American men and women police officers who felt, and Danielle knows this, who felt very comfortable writing the report saying, in words my not 10 year olds here, but profanity laced reports denigrating the lives of these women and that their stories would, could not possibly be true, and felt free to write them in a report. The most crass of terms of the way these lies were referred to. And so we knew very, very quickly that we wanted to do three things. We wanted to make sure that every single sexual assault kit that occurred after August of 09 was tested. It was a big fight, nobody really cared at the time. It wasn't really until a couple of years later when it became politically good thing to recognize these kids when people started paying attention and then basically it was easier for us to raise money. And so we made sure that the Detroit Police Department changed their policy. And it took a long time, but they finally changed their general policy to say that every kid would go to the lab post-2009. Another thing we did in 2010, and this is all while we were processing the cases that we could, getting the kids tested that we could. We started out by getting 400 tested, and then uh, 1,600 tested, and then four years into it, we received money from the state, $4 million, that went to the state crime lab to have another 8,000 tested. And as I said, about six months ago, the last 619 went to the lab. Don't add that up, but it comes up to 11,341. <laughs> and so, we've, like I said before, we're finally getting them tested. And I'll tell you about our results in a minute. But we knew we had to change the legislation. We knew that we had to make sure that this didn't happen again. And one way to do that was to make a state law that stated that all kids have to go to the lab. So we started writing this legislation, doing the research, and we found out 
that some states did have some kind of laws. It's a very few, Illinois was one, Colorado was another. There were only a few states that we stole from them, their best ideas, and try to adapt it to the culture that we had here in Detroit. And so it really took off. I had a chance meeting with Mariska Hargitay, the, the star of Law and Order SVU. She came to Detroit. We invited legislators who weren't returning our calls before that to come. She charmed them all. And that bill passed to the Michigan legislature faster than anything I've ever seen in all these years. Democrats, Republican, Tea Partiers, it was nonpartisan, as this issue should be. So the law basically says that within 14 days of a rape kit being taken here in Wayne County from the forensic nurses, that that police jurisdiction, wherever it is, because it's a statewide law, has to pick up that kit. They have another 14 days to take that, that kit to the crime lab. And the one caveat with the crime lab, you have to have the resources and the testing abilities to test them. They had 90 days, assuming the resources were there, to get that kit tested. Most of our kits were shipped to outside labs, but with 90 days to get them tested, and then after the testing was done, the police had to then another 14 days to pick it up and bring it back to police storage. So as a part of all that, a statewide commission was, was also formed, and I'll tell you about that in a minute. But the third thing that we did is we said from the very, very beginning in 2009 that if you can track a package that you order online from Amazon, Overstock, wherever you order from, you can go online and see where that package is. So if that package is supposed to be at your house by tomorrow at 5 o'clock, and at 5.01 it's not there, then you're wondering where it is. So if we can do that internationally, because millions and millions of packages are shipped every day, and that they can be tracked, but we ought to be able to track a rate track a rape kit through the criminal justice system in our state. So we did a pilot program. We did a pilot program in, uh, with UPS because we didn't want to reinvent the wheel. We said, well, we will just go to a logistics company, one of the companies that ships packages. And it just so happens that Dan Gilbert and uses UPS. And we found that out, and then we contacted UPS, and they did a pilot project free, pro bono, no taxpayer dollars tested for 18 months. And during that 18 month period of time, we knew where every, this is post 2009, we're not talking about the kids that we found, we were still working on those, but post 2009 for 18 months, we, they provided scanners for us. When a rape kit was done, it was scanned because every kit has, I don't know if you've ever seen one, I probably should have brought one, but it has a barcode. And that barcode was scanned. When it was picked up by the Detroit Police Department, it was scanned. When it was taken to the lab, it was scanned. And when it was picked back up to the lab, it was scanned. So we knew where that rape kit was at every bit in turn. And during that 18 month period, no rape kit at all, no sexual assault kit at all was lost. We knew exactly where it was. So that led to, as part of the bill that I talked about earlier, a statewide commission being formed. And I was a part of that commission, and one of the goals was, and this is years later, but one of the goals was to develop a statewide tracking system in the state of Michigan. At the time we started working on this, we were the first state that was doing it. Before we got done, because it took us a while, there were other states, and I don't remember what they are now, that we have a statewide tracking system. But one of my dreams was, I obviously wanted it tracked from the time it was picked up to the time it went to the lab to the time it got back, but one of my dreams was to make sure there was a victim portal of some kind that a victim would be assigned a code and they can go into the system and they can know where the rape kit was. Because if they did, then if it was three months old, three months old and they hadn't heard anything, a year and they hadn't heard anything, they can, they can then start again at that point trying to inquire what happened to their kid. It keeps the system honest. So it took many years, but Michigan now has a statewide tracking system. It was piloted in Battle Creek. Calhoun County, all the stakeholders had, and I can't explain, I'm not a techie, but all the stakeholders had a code that they had to enter into a statewide a, a computer system. And so the police had one, and when the, the forensic nurses or hospitals, because some parts of our state are not, are not um, lucky enough to have the wonderful forensic nurses we have here in Wayne County. And so sometimes hospitals, doctors, offices, and they will have a portal that they enter, a health portal, they have to enter where that kid is. And then each police department, and this is Calhoun County, Battle Creek is the largest city in Calhoun County, then the Battle Creek Police Department would enter it and they have a code that they would enter. And then when they took it to the lab, the statewide lab has a code that they would enter. And again, when it's picked up, they would enter it. And also the victim now has a portal where they can look and see. We don't tell our survivor anything about the case. We can't do that investigatively. We want to make sure that when we take this to a jury or a judge, if it gets that far, that they're not tainted in any way by information 
information that we would give them. So I'm told it's not going to be piloted, it's not, it's not going to be rolled out in Wayne County, we're going to be the last in southeastern Michigan until the end of the year. And so as we speak, many areas are being trained, they're going in, in different sections across the state, training all the stakeholders into know how to have and operate the system. We don't yet have any kind of accountability features. In other words, when we first started working in 2010, um, going back to legislation, we didn't have any kind of accountability. So we didn't have any kind of sanctions for people who didn't want to turn their kids in. And so we wanted it passed, we wanted a, an accountability system passed, and so we knew that later we were gonna have to go back and try to get those in because we didn't want to scare off the police. We didn't want and the, the police association, the sheriff's association were on board, but they said we would have difficulty getting it passed if we had any kind of accountability sanctions or any sanctions in it. So now, of course, state to, to just to wrap up, uh, the, the state has a statewide system, a tracking system now that's brand new and hasn't been rolled out in very many cities yet. But we certainly have that state law that says if you have kids, you must follow the procedure that I told you about earlier. One last thing, as also as a result of the work that we did in Wayne County and the, and the statewide commission, each and every city in the state was audited to see how many kids they had. And that was on the honor system. So if a city told us that they had so many kids or they had none, we really didn't go by anything other than it was on the honor system. And we found out there were many, many more kids in the state, not in the thousands, but in the hundreds. And so we basically know, based on the honor system, how many kids each, each, people, each city has, or each police department has, each jurisdiction has. So it's a step in the right direction. Um, basically, in the criminal justice system, we react to what we get. So we're not, we're, we try to be proactive, but we're more reactive about something that's already happened. And so uh, hopefully, I have a number of many other ideas that we can help put in place to, to try to stop the advent of sexual violence. But one of the ways to do that is to not to have backtrack, backtrack rape kits because we have over 800, eight, over 830 of our, of our testing results of our defendants are serial rapists. Eight, oh, this has identified over 830 serial rapists. More than one person that has sexually assaulted a more than one woman just in one city, in one county, and in one state. So again, the way to combat sexual violence, one of the biggest ways is to prosecute these kids and to make sure you really attack and focus on your serial rapists. Thank you, Prosecutor, really for that sobering and inspiring message. Um, Amanda Tomashow is Campus Sexual Assault Response and Prevention Coordinator at Michigan Public Health uh, Institute, NPHI. Uh, she is a sister survivor who serves as co-curator um, at the MSU Museum for the upcoming exhibition that you've heard about, Finding Our Voice, Sister Survivors Speak. She recently attended the State of the Union Address as guest of Representative Melissa Slotkin in Washington, D.C. I'll just mention all of us at the museum uh, are particularly grateful for Amanda uh, for her continued and eloquent insistence uh, that all of us need to be critically involved in, uh, in interrogating our own positions of privilege and putting issues of race, class, justice, and expanding the circle of, of inclusion um, as wide as humanly possible in the continuing struggle against sexual violence. And for that, Amanda, we're very grateful. Um, you might recognize me from my Juice Cleanse videos. I was like, well, um, not my Instagram, it's fine. So I, I would like to say, I guess I didn't really prepare remarks. Um, it's been a rocky two weeks for me, but I, as one of the sister survivors, I could not um, help but notice that our stories were listened to and taken a little bit more seriously because we were, a lot of us came from places of privilege. And I can't stop thinking about it. Um, at the same time that Angie Povolitis was working on our case, she was working on another case, um, um, a survivor named Shawana, who no longer with us because Shawana's case didn't get the same outcome that ours got. Um, Shawana had been raped by a man named Calvin Kelly, and she had reported it, and because of the color of her skin, she was not listened to. And Calvin Kelly went on to rape 
over a dozen women, and every single time he knew he could get away with it because he knew that he was picking victims whose stories were not going to be listened to. He found victims that he could discredit based on the color of their skin and their socioeconomic status, and, and that's just messed up. That is not okay. I'm not okay with it. And I just can't stop thinking about Shawana. And I can't, I remember at the ESPYs, um, we got invited up onto stage, onto the stage at, to receive the Arthur Ashe Courage Award, and I just couldn't stop thinking. Um, would they have invited Calvin Kelly's victims up here? Would they have put them on the stage? Would anybody have cared? I would have. So, so I recognize my privilege. I recognize that I was listened to because I am white and I come from a family that has money and I'm cute and I'm nice and I'm whatever, all of the things that make me a compelling victim that can be listened to and believed, but it's not lost on me the way that Anita Hill was treated versus the way that, and I love her, she's so great and she's so strong, but it is not lost on me. And I don't think that it's lost on any of you either, and that's why you're here. Um, it's not lost on me that R. Kelly's victims are still locked up somewhere. Why aren't we doing anything about that? Why are we still listening to his music? I mean, seriously, he was, we saw him doing awful things uh, over a decade ago, I think, and people have still created music with him, and they still celebrated him, and they still played him on the radio, and they, like, I'm sorry, in what universe does that make sense? In, it's a, in a universe where white supremacy runs deep, and we have patriarchal institutions that oppress anybody that isn't a white man, a straight white man, and, just I'm not okay with it anymore. So yes, I pushed and I pushed and I. We, we have to talk about this. We have to have this conversation. And I. So basically, now that I have got on my little um, rant, I'm here to listen. So that is all. And our uh, our uh, our final panelist is. Uh, Ariana Castillo, uh, who is a 21-year-old sister survivor. She's a former competitive gymnast and cheerleader, and we are delighted that her family is here tonight. Hello, everyone. Hello. <laughs> Can you see that? Thank you for watching everyone today. <laughs> Um, I would like to get started by kind of reflecting on this past year and how it's kind of played out for me. Um, kind of like what Amanda has said, it's been nice to kind of have our platform um, with everybody being able to listen to us. Um, it's kind of been a bit weird from my standpoint that um, I've kind of had trouble with some interviews with people reaching out to me. Um, I know I've had trouble with a recent reporter uh, where she tried to question my credibility just because she couldn't find my name on some website. Um, I know she, I tried to tell her, like, you know, you can look up my video and everything, you can find me uh, speaking at the trial. She just, like, would not have it. So, um, you know, it's just kind of things like that. I just wish people would actually take the time and actually listen to survivors, you know. I believe you really shouldn't do that to any sort of survivor, ever question their credibility, because that's how we get to the place where we are now. Um, that makes people not want to speak up and take action. <laughs> so that's where I'm coming from today. Um, you know, at the SBs, like Amanda was just talking about, I got together with a group of the girls, and we had this really long conversation about 
how it's been for all of us. And I know representation has been a big part of our of this year for us, how it's been. And I believe it was just me and two other people. We were kind of the only other ethnic people in this group. So we really kind of struggled with that. And seeing that on social media as well, a lot of people were like, whoa, out of this entire group, why aren't more women of color coming and speaking out about this? I kind of feel like it's kind of an ethnic kind of standpoint from that where we need to talk about that um, because I feel like it's not a much discussed issue that that we really take seriously. I mean, I guess we can talk about it more amongst any culture, I guess, really. But even getting help is just hard from any perspective. I mean, I tried getting help when I was younger. Even from school, they noticed a change in my behavior, and they just kind of wrote me off and just did absolutely nothing about it. Um, whereas other people, they just really focused in on it, just really wanted to help them more so than they would have helped me. They really dug into them. But um, I just really think that we need to take time and just learn from you know our experience in this whole issue that we saw from our whole NASAR trial just because it got so much media attention that I think we could really learn from it all. <laughs> I think that's about all I have left to say. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Ari. All right, can, I, can I just ask what, uh, before we go into a larger discussion, there's just so much that you said. So is it your sense that these sort of longer term patterns that make it more and more difficult for, for women of color uh, to get help, even within the school system, the counseling system, and so forth, uh, uh, that one's, cons one's needs get sort of pushed aside, uh, and while others who are have the cultural capital or the privilege to play the system a little more efficiently. Yeah, I think that it's just a broad issue overall, you know, altogether that, you know, they just kind of focus on, you know, you just, you just kind of get passed over. Um, they just don't take you seriously at all, you know, I don't know. But, you know, they just, they really don't focus on you whatsoever. I mean, I came from a small school. I was one of like five ethnic people there, but they just really did, they didn't do anything for me at all. So that was part of my issue there. I know I had other issues at that school as well, and they also did nothing um, during that time for me as well. So, I mean, they could have just been the school, but I know I had other friends who struggled um, at different schools. Um, along with sexual abuse. They had problems coming to their family for help. They had problems coming to their counselors for help. They just kind of get passed over. Those are such vital issues. Um, so maybe we can open up the conversation. There's obviously so much our panelists can talk among themselves, but we, we do want to make sure we, we include all of you who come out. Uh, if we ask you to use the microphone, it makes it easier for the video to pick things up and for everyone to, uh, everyone to hear. Uh, so uh, please uh, ask specific questions or share a thought uh, or reflection. Thank you. Um, I have a thought and then a, and then a question that maybe could provoke uh, multiple responses. Um, at the last State Board of Education meeting, it was talked about the model code of conduct and a response for consequence for actions in schools were, was a discussion. And uh, the discussion was uh, 
kind of based on black girls and what they experience, um, especially in the state of Michigan. And the fact was thrown out that black girls are eight times more likely to get kicked out of school for their behavior, if you will. So um, that was baked into the understanding of the model student code of conduct. But then we also discussed why is that, talked about the trauma process, and within the trauma process really is sexual assault and sexual violence. So I really wonder about how that whole conversation comes together and what can schools, K through 12 and higher education do? What kind of policy should they be moving, uh, direction should they be moving in to help prevent or inform that trauma that impacts black girls um, and their success in education overall is, is I guess my question attached to that thought process. So one of the things I think that is happening um, in education within Michigan in particular is a move to make some reforms um, as far as the code of conduct and disciplinary action. Um, a lot of the schools in Michigan have historically had a zero tolerance policy in place. Um, now we're moving more into the direction of reformative type of thinking about disciplinary action, particularly within K-12 schools. But speaking to the issue that you spoke to before about young girls um, being eight times more likely to be expelled or suspended from school is that there is a history of viewing particularly black girls as more violent, older, more, I don't know how, how to put it, but, but essentially saying that they, they are more um, likely to be disruptive um, as a kind of a general understanding. Um, and so that leaks into the policy making process um, in terms of education. But we're starting to, because of the conversations about um, the, the school to prison pipeline, have more conversations about what discipline should, like, should look like, and particularly for students of color. And so we will see this progression, um, particularly in the state of Michigan. This is getting a lot more attention, and a lot of the public schools, particularly DPSCD, um, is also looking at how discipline will be reformed and getting rid of those zero tolerance policies that have been in place for many, many years. So this is an ongoing conversation. It's not yet a done deal across the state, but we are taking um, more reflective action in terms of what K-12 education and disciplinary code of conduct looks like. I think one thing that, that would, so, I work with various uh, teachers in Lansing, and one of the things that comes up is this conversation about um, the behavior of black girls, and I think one of the things that we are trying to think about and should be thinking about is how can education be more proactive and not reactive. So for me, the word discipline like is like nails on a chalkboard for me. Like I, I can't stand that, I, just the, the word like, runs me. And so I think there's something about, if we think about, if we know there are people who are interested in prison abolition, then that ties back into, if, if we can imagine a world with no prisons, then what can we imagine for for discipline and education for our kids? Because if, the, if we abolish, if we're working towards prison abolition, and we really imagine like how do we start to how do we start to like um, rehabilitate and provide services to people? Then the prison, the school of prison, the pipeline cuts off, and so now you're asking the question of what is the purpose of schools? And so in that in that matter, then it's like well how can we make sure we better support teachers? How can we better equip schools to have uh, social workers, therapists, like 
I think about all the things that come to MSU, the therapy dogs that show up at, during finals week, what would it look like to take those to, to schools, right? What would it look like to actually give students the tools they need before anything happens so that they know that school is a place where they can actually come and share information? Because that's usually the acting out is that nobody's been listening to me. This is the same teacher that told me, you know, yesterday to shut up and go sit in the corner. But I'm supposed to trust this person to help me get my needs met, like to, to share that something is going on at home. And so for me, it's like, how can we start to think about um, not just restorative, but I know we have a colleague who talks about transformative justice. What does it mean to bring transformative like justice practices into our classrooms and into our schools and better equip and support our teachers? So that this kind, so that it's not so much, of, so that we can cut things off at the knees and really help students ahead of time. Because the second, the kind of violence, the other part of this is that I think that there's something that comes up, and I heard this today when I went to a, a Bible study, is that black girls don't even see themselves as being victims because if they're too, they're too dark skinned to be assaulted or they're, they're, nobody's checking for them. I hear some other college girls. I'm nobody's checking for me. And so how do we start to have this conversation about what is violence? Because I think in our minds, sexual violence is this really like crazy thing that happens in the bushes somewhere. And it's like, not everybody has that experience. So something might've happened to you. And as a, as a teacher or as a, as a educator, like let's talk about what happened. Right, because it's not going to look like what you see on SVU. It might be something much different. So that's my thing. Is like, how can we start to get a transformative justice approach to K twelve education um, to kind of cut some of this this off? And I think you know, part of the sort of disciplinary or the, um, the the schools to prisons pipeline is that you know in the nineteen seventies they started adding cops to schools in mostly urban areas and criminalized behavior um, in cities like Detroit and elsewhere that weren't criminalized in white suburbs. So if I you know, was disruptive in class, you know, they might talk to my mother or they might just you know, tell me to be quiet or you know, have me sit down, but I wouldn't be criminalized for it. Um, and so kids started getting tickets you know, arrested, and, and and how many schools are there still police, right? So a, a average adolescent behavior, particularly in communities of color, is seen as criminal behavior. And that's just an enormous problem that's led to a massive increase in uh, prison populations, which is just completely unnecessary. And historically, black children um, and children of color are not treated like kids, right? They're, they're, um, they're treated like adults. They're treated like criminals. They're not even seen as kids. Right, if you think about what happened with Trayvon Martin, right? I mean, he's just a kid. Um, and any of these other shootings that we've seen in the last few years, they're not allowed to be kids. And so um, that's a problem that's rooted in white supremacy and in our culture that, that we need to change. And um, yeah. Other questions, thoughts, uh, reflections? this is a question I'm not exactly sure so kind of continuing the conversation and thinking about um, the bodies of girls of color and women of color um, so if we start if we're starting off with the thought that they're already hyper sexualized and marked in a way so like how do we push the conversation past that because we're talking about them already adopting the mindset that they're, they're, they are unrapeable or that they cannot be victims or survivors because they cause the, the sheer essence of them being um, a girl of color caused some type of action to happen to them. So like, how do we push the conversation forward past that? Because I feel like we've kind of had those same conversations about the hypersexuality of girls of colors for years now, but we haven't really moved forward, um, moved the conversation forward. So like, what are some of the, the ideas that you all have about moving that conversation forward and kind of coming up with practices to kind of rescript how we even teach girls of color to see themselves. Well, the panel is pondering that. <laughs> I sense you may have some ideas <laughs> on how to. Uh, I mean, is it possible that I mean, you're thinking of your own work in literary studies and 
and it struggles to sort of to repossess and transform narratives. Um, is, is that is that is there critical work to be done around the very nature of storytelling? I mean, I, I definitely think so. So the work that I do, I'm a graduate student. Um, so the work that I do um, thinks about how we empower Black girls to tell their own stories and talk about their own experiences. But um, some of the comments that you all made made me think very critically about how do we undo that work because it's passed down. And as, as a survivor of sexual violence, that was my thought process, that I did something because we are so quick to victim shame, especially being a girl of color. You are told that you've done something. You automatically go to that place. So how do we undo that? that work when you look at surviving R. Kelly and, think, and listen to different victims, they think that they caused it, that there was something, some type of behavior because black girls are thought of and they think of themselves as not being good enough to even be. And you know, the language around that is, you know, horrible to say, but they don't even think that they are worthy or they could be considered, you know, for some type of violence. So how do we change the script? Like how do we read help them rethink about them, their bodies and their lives and their essence as valuable in a way to even begin to talk about their own violence because they don't see it as violence because they think it's just something that happens to them. So I want to I wanted to just speak to that because, you know, again, you know, looking back at the young girls that I used to counsel in the school clinics, those girls didn't see what they were doing in, in the engagement of this activity with these men as anything wrong. And the reason why I think they didn't is because they were seeking attention, love, to be embraced, to be affirmed in a way that they were not getting elsewhere. And I think that we as a society really have to concentrate on how we affirm girls particularly girls of color in our society, in our family, how we embrace them, how we counsel them to know better, to know that they are worthy, that they are valuable, that their lives matter. Um, and I think that if they were surrounded by um, communities that actually, and adults that actually show concern and recognize them for who they are as individuals, then we would move a lot further, a lot faster. But we don't really do that. We don't really concentrate on that. I think there are some movements that are, are trying to get to that, like Pretty Brown Girls and, and some of the other um, movements, but it's not widespread. Yeah, I, I come I come at this from a different perspective. I think I think that we have to be careful. I don't I don't necessarily agree with everything that's been said been said here. Um, I think we come at I come at it from a different perspective than some others. And I can just tell you what I know and what I see. And I think we have to be careful not to say all or every, because every woman that is sexually assaulted, every survivor doesn't come from the same place with the same experience. I do agree that um, as I said before, people, women of color and, and sexual assault survivors of color are treated very differently. But I also think that when we look at the general society and we look at you know some of these dance shows and we look at videos, and, and this may be the easy way out, but it's not just being overly sexual, sexualized, it's also, and maybe this is a, a way to be overly sexualized, it's also paying attention to the surrounding and what affects people. And you, you really pointed on it earlier, what my point is. I have, as many people at this table probably have a huge problem with, of course, you know, R. Kelly, and how he is still held up, and many people that are, are maybe not, have not been, been, been um, the predators like he is, but the actions that they do are sometimes the same. You know, I call it this, the generation, the Kardashian generation, when we worship people who really are not worthy, when we um, idolize people who really are not worthy, when we model our behavior patterns after people who really shouldn't be, instead of we should be focusing on what she said earlier about, you know, brown girls matter. My, my own daughter, my, I have twin daughters, that's one of them back there, and one of them's darker and one of them's a little lighter. And I have people coming up all the time will say something to my other twin, hello, you're so beautiful, you're so this and you're so that, and we'll look at her and walk away. 
And so it's all about how people see themselves and self-esteem. I know that's overly simply saying that someone who is smarter than me in academia, but the point I'm trying to make, I think that we have to be very, very careful and not say everybody is the same and every person of color experiences this because each and every case that we've done, and even cases that were outside the realm of these rape kids, their story was different, their backgrounds were different, and where they came from was different. I think generally we see a lot of similarities, but I think that we really need to take a look at our society as a whole and what we are teaching, especially our young girls, all girls, not just girls of color, what's important and what's not. I, I don't allow my children to watch TV, and you can't, you can't keep them safe from all that all the time, but that's one way is making it what's important in your household, and I, I know it all goes back to the home, and we heard, we've heard all that before, but I just think that when we're talking about issues like this, we have to be able to have a more broader perspective. And this, I think, when you said that, the one thing I realized that actually slightly tackles this question is it's not just girls. Uh, uh, no, so, I'm, so in, in the sense of the other people who need to be educated, which then li links us back to conversations about schools and communities, are how do we, because we know in the case of R. Kelly or Chris Brown and Rihanna, like all of these individuals have experienced some trauma and that doesn't let them off the hook, but that but these experiences never have never been processed or taken seriously, right? So that men can't do X, men can't emote, men can't seek mental health, blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Like, so as a result of that, that's not saying that that lets people off the hook, but there needs to be also conversations about how do we stop sexual violence is by stopping people from committing sexual violence against others, right? So, so like, I think that's one of, so it's a, it's a two-sided revolving door, whatever metaphor you want to use to talk about sexual violence that oftentimes in the case of what, we're, what you were talking about earlier, young ladies being with older men okay, well, older man, why are you with this 15-year-old, right? Like, what, what can we talk about that? Like, so that is not just the girl's fault for looking for validation outside of herself. It's also why do you feel as though that's a good age range for you to be dating, right? And having consensual or however we want. What, so just having conversations about relationships, having conversations about our own understanding of, of beauty, self-worth, um, so, and well, I mean, because that was one of the things that my student brought up. She was like, you know the state of Michigan that is technically, like, it's legal for this age, it's, it's consensual sex, and I was like, excuse me? Right, so it's like all these different things, and I was like, I had no idea. So how do we start to have these conversations um, on both sides of the coin? That's not just so much about what we need to teach black girls and girls and, and girls of color, but what do we also need to teach um, men and gender non-conforming? Like, how do we start to have conversations about respecting one, other, one another's bodies? But don't we let people off the hook all the time, though? Right, and that's what, that's what we do. Right, and that's what I'm saying. We don't. I don't want to let men off the hook. I think we need to address. As a society, we let people off the hook all the time. Mm -hmm. It's because he's our killer, because he's Michael Jackson, because he's a person of privilege, because he's a person of wealth. You, you get all this. Our, our president. You know, we get all. You know, they get off the hook all the time for similar behavior, mm -hmm. and we do nothing. We seemingly, I know people are working in this field all the time, but we seemingly do nothing to make sure that they're on the hook. And it's perfectly acceptable for them to be let off the hook, depending on your wealth and your privilege. Right. So that that is what is maddening, because we do do that, and that's why it's so hard for people who do what I do to even convince jury, and other women, when women are sexually assaulted, are the worst people to have on these juries, because they're more judgmental than any man ever is. So when you have, when I was trying these sexual assault cases, and I had, and I and I made, I kicked as many people off the women off the jury as I possibly could, because they were judging what these women, they're the harshest critics. And so we excuse people and their behavior all the time. And that's one of the reasons why we're, we, we, we are where we are. Mm -hmm. I was, can I just sort of building off of what you just said and what you said earlier, um, it, you know, with the Shawana Hall case, uh, it, was a, it was a jury of mostly women, white women, who really refused to see Shawana Hall as a legitimate victim of Calvin Kelly's predation. And, you know, I, I don't know what we do to educate jurors, um, but I do know that we have a responsibility to educate ourselves about the ways in which, um, you know, the criminal justice system um, doesn't see certain people as legitimate victims, as people deserving of bodily integrity and, and human dignity, and, and the ways in which we participate in that by making judgments or offering excuses or, you know, um, justifying certain behavior based on status or 
uh, privilege. So it, you know, we're all citizens of potential jurors and, and in some of these cases, and, and so we need to do better just in general, and we need to do better in validating um, people's experiences, and also finding beauty in places where we're not taught by our culture to see beauty, right? Uh, our, our culture celebrates white beauty, it celebrates white supremacy, it celebrates a certain kind of thinness, a certain kind, we, I mean, there are standards of beauty, and we need to work hard to fight against those ideas and those standards, not only with our daughters and the girls in our lives that we know, but with our with ourselves too. Valerie, um, I just have a question for Ariana. Um, you mentioned feeling that you were overlooked in when you had um, experiences in school, overlooked by counselors. So I'm really curious, what do you think really helped you in this case to come forward? Um, and second part of that is. You mentioned representation among the group of survivors. I would f guess that there may be, and maybe I'm wrong, but you know there are more. We know there are probably more survivors out there. What do you think would help them come forward, women of color, um, if they were in your sports groups? Um, well, I think what helped them come forward is just you know being able to feel more comfortable. Um, and having this topic a bit more talked about. Cause I know it was something that was extremely hard for me to do. Um, I know I didn't even talk to my mom about wanting to speak. I just kind of told her, hey, we're going to go to the court. And then she found out everything the day I spoke. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, that was kind of tough for her. <laughs> um, so it's just being able to discuss these things a bit more openly and freely that would be able to help people um, come forward about these things because it is a very uncomfortable topic. Um, it was even uncomfortable afterwards because, you know, it's just something that, you know, we, we really just don't speak about that often. But even at the school, I would go to tell them, you know, I don't feel comfortable. And they're just like, oh, you're just a child. You just don't know anything. So it's just things like that that just really make you over, you make you feel overlooked. And it's just, you can tell them over and over again. I know I told my coaches over and over again. And you, you just know the outcome of that. Just, we all got ignored. <laughs> so it's just things like that that it just, it really helps to have these discussions about. All of this goes to uh, just, I mean, it, it goes to these two interrelated themes that we keep on hearing about tonight, the sites of belonging, as Dr. Butler said, and the flip side of that is insisting on sites of accountability, uh, institutional accountability, and those of us at MSU are just made aware every day the more we learn of the profound failures of institutional accountability, how easy it was and continues to be for, for far too many people to say this isn't my responsibility. Um, and and then reproducing precisely the structures of violence. In other words, that, uh, or even saying we're going to deal with this quietly behind the scenes, uh, but for God's sakes, don't speak out publicly, uh, as uh, even, and especially not as administrators. Uh, so it, 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 it seems so vital to hold those two sides of the coin uh, constantly uh, present uh, to think about all the many different forms of, of, of belonging. Uh, and, uh, and Dr. Butler mentioned the, the social media, which can be, as we know, so destructive, but also profoundly liberating. Um, and then to insist on this kind of accountability, whether or not it's at the level of coaches all the way up to athletic directors or, or the counseling apparatus and so many other things. So I'm, uh, um, and I, I suppose, I, I think we, we think a lot about this in the museum because we're constantly asked, okay, you know, there are possibilities of change, of, 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 of reformation, but why do this publicly? Why have an incident? Why be so out there? And our sense increasingly is that if, if everybody doesn't do this, it, it's on absolutely all of us. Uh, otherwise, we're all complicit in, in this long history of, of really criminal negligence by our institution and as well as the larger culture. So. Um. 
And one thing I said, and, and you're hearing all this stuff about Michigan State, and Michigan State, and then when, when it happened at Penn State years ago, and what I've told people all the time, don't think your institution is immune. I mean, just because you haven't heard that it happened at your university, and I told, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm obviously a Wolverine, and I said, <laughs> yeah, it's happening down the road, but don't think that something like that can't or won't or hasn't happened here. So I think a lot of it has to do with policing ourselves, not just policing our family and our children, but policing the institutions that we belong to. And sometimes even going looking for it to make sure everything's okay. I think, too, one of the things that, that um, is important to recognize is that in all of these conversations, I think there's a, a reliving or, or triggering of additional traumas. Um, I had an experience, you know, personally uh, within my own family that was triggered by some of the conversations and, um, you know, the confirmation hearings. It brought up old trauma. And when confronting family members about that trauma, it was as if, I can't do anything. That's old. You know, it's, it's like, so, so I can't do anything because the statute of limitations has run out or, you know, for whatever reason, we shouldn't address it now because it's, it's, it's in the past. And we, I think as a society, fail each other by failing to recognize that trauma reemerges and gets triggered and re-triggered until it's resolved. And we're not doing a good job at building institutions that help us resolve that trauma. One comment that just kind of brings it together, but I think it's great that MSU is engaging such a panel like this, and credit to Mark Oslander for um, you know, fighting back against the institution, which I'm sure was not uh, entirely supportive of uh, holding panels like this. Um, and thanks also to Amanda and Ariana, especially because I know it's been a you know really hard year. So for you two to continue to stand up and speak out, um, and this is a, you know even a particularly difficult topic today um, to be here. I think speaks volumes and to continue talking. Um, and also thank you all for the panelists for being here to continue to talk about obviously this is an issue each of you are struggling with are thinking about um, I think Dr. Butler just said, said something earlier about the, the past is the past except when it what was the part? <laughs> I wrote it down but it was exactly the same thing that you're talking about which is the past is the past until it until it's resolved. Uh, yeah, but you about coming, from, I don't know, I could picture it in my mind in a visual, but um, so I think that, you know, these are continuing issues that it's, you know, particularly, uh, uh, particularly apropos for our history museum to be talking about the way these issues that are here and part of our past uh, reaching forward and trying to figure out how to move forward to create safer institutions, create a safer world for um, everybody. That's my comment there. I have one last thought, and it's been, and it's thinking about institutions um, and what they were decreed to do. Um, and so I've just been thinking about that a lot because I've, because um, in the in the wake of the Nasser case, um, I've had so many students come to my office and like talk about their own kind of like sexual trauma. Uh, and, and it made me think about my own, and I was like, okay, so now what do we do with this? Um, and then we realized that institutions are not created for, for that to happen. And they're not created for traumas to be resolved. They're not created for people to be restored. Like that's not that's not what these institutions are created for, right? Like they're created for something else. And so I guess my question will always be: doesn't matter what panel you put me on. It's always what is our imagining of something different? How do how can we start to envision and imagine something different and collectively work towards that thing? Because so often I I think we we ask. Um, things to do something that they actually were never created to do in the first place. 
Um, I think about that specifically. I think about that often when we walk across MSU's campus because it's a land grant institution, which it waves that flag. It is also built on land that does not belong to it, right? And so if we're going to talk about trauma and we're going to talk about what institutions will and won't do, there's a lot of things that the word violence holds. And while we are at this moment talking about sexual violence against people who are walking across a campus built on violence, then we really need to have a conversation about what institutions are actually created to do. And so that's, that's always something that will resonate with me. And so what is our charge for wherever institutions we're a part of, schools, legal, educational, whatever, churches, right? Like what, are, what is our responsibility to make those to either, to, to re-envision either the institution or re-envision the thing that it's, that will get us to a better place. Because at this level, we're working in silos and hoping that everybody will get the same message. But we also know that we're working in institutions that are that are inherently violent. So. In that connection, it, it, it's interesting. We, we're at the 200th anniversary this year of the uh, of the Saginaw session. Um, at MSU and many other institutions across the state are going to be pondering that as we especially get into September. And, and there are all these ironies and contradictions, right, as we talk about doing land acknowledgments, but a ceremony to acknowledge vast theft and, and, and genocide, and then we go on and move to the next item on the agenda. We'll build the wall. Then build the wall so we don't have to think about any of these issues. And, uh, build, a, build up that monument to white supremacy and patriarchy and so forth. But, but these are issues that, that many of our, our Native community partners have been urging us at MSU to uh, address uh, the to look at a m memorial processes around uh, the stories of uh, traffic missing murdered Native women uh, and that needs to be central to the work that we're doing here as we think about what this space of Detroit is as well as the space that MSU is built on uh, the, the long history both places that were histories of, have histories of uh, the exchange of in Native American pre-contact eras, the exchange of ideas and, and, and peoples and, uh, and goods and so forth, uh, there is a profoundly positive model to, to be celebrated while never losing sight of these long histories of, of structural violence. Uh, and, and that, we can overuse the term healing, but that process of very careful, close recognition and critical self-examination and dialogue uh, around the stories that land had, the land has to tell us, if we could only listen, uh, might be a way back towards our humanity. Um, so we're, we're really at the end of our of a lot of time. We are enormously grateful to the MSU Detroit Center for hosting this and for all of you for participating in this conversation for everybody to come out, coming out uh, tonight. Uh, in, and we hope the weather is safe for everybody going home. I do want to mention this is a part of a continuing process, uh, not the first this speaker series. Uh, we will gather again out at the MSU Museum on March 12th uh, for a conversation about journalism, about mass media. Well, these are issues that sister survivors have brought up again and again. Uh, as Amanda noted, uh, uh, the media has been an important platform, but it has uh, been highly variable in terms of which stories get classified as, as worth covering and which aren't, both in terms of broadcast and print and, and other media. So we're going to have conversations with scholars of journalism and with practitioners, uh, print and broadcast, including radio, um, including Kate Wells of the Believe podcast. We'll, we'll gather again, uh, all of us, April 16th for the opening of the exhibition, which we invite all of you to. That's a Tuesday evening. Um, there'll be a tree planting that week as well uh, in honor of sister survivors. Uh, then the following week, April 23rd, uh, we'll sort of wrap things up at the end of our semester um, with a discussion uh, which includes Ellen Schottsneider, who's kindly videoing here, who's a scholar at, at, at Brandeis and a scholar of art and uh, the healing in the wake of trauma. She'll be in conversation with the sister survivors who are artists uh, themselves, whose work is represented, uh, as well as our designer. We'll have a really a discussion about art, ceremony, and healing in the wake of, in the wake of, of, of violent trauma. And then we'll go upstairs uh, in a more celebratory mode uh, for, the, uh, for a poetry slam event, a spoken word event with the poetry uh, performed by allies as well as sister survivors. But we're looking for more ideas uh, for programming here. This is, I think, all of us 
I think I speak for Gina as well, uh, and for everybody at the museum, we feel we're in this for the long haul. And we're looking for your ideas for different kinds of programs, discussions that, like this one, are intellectually rigorous and emotionally honest, as searing as these conversations are. So please share with us your ideas, and we will do everything we can to expand this, this dialogue and this conversation. But thanks to everybody.